tonight is our text, 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 6. And I'm just going to go ahead and institute some church rules, not for the year, but for tonight. Rule tonight, after I've seen so many yawns, is that if you yawn, I'm going to penalize you. So don't yawn, or you'll make me yawn. And the person who yawns is going to have to fill up my uh, Hershey's Kiss uh, jar right here. I have no Hershey's Kisses to give the kids. So don't yawn, or you owe me Hershey's Kisses, all right? And so that's the penalty tonight. Second Corinthians, I'm not sure how I can enforce that, but uh, <laughs> it's a good idea. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. You know, I learned early in ministry that a shepherd leads, he doesn't uh, drive. And that really is true. And I hope you understand when I make jokes about things like that, that I'm only, that I'm only joking because uh, that's just an important truth. And I remember being in... Uh, leadership in uh, school in Christian college and you get put in leadership and one of the things you do is enforce you know you make people do what they're supposed to do and it's a little bit of transition to go from that to where if you don't do what I say you'll be in the dean's office to uh, dealing with people that do what they do out of a heart to love the Lord Jesus Christ and that ought to be the motive behind all of us and I hope that you never feel as though you're being pressured or coerced into something speaking of that I would like to read some verses that are related to that. And so let's look at uh, verse 10, 11, and uh, 10 and 11 and 12. And, uh, or, yeah, 10 through 13, really. And uh, we'll, we'll take the whole text later on. Uh, we'll go through it. But uh, I'd just like to kind of uh, pick up a, uh, in, in, a, in a message that complements where we ended in 1 Corinthians last week as well as that fits with our theme of the year, which has to do with rejoicing, okay? So look at verse 10. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing many things. Um, oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. You're not straightening us, but you're straightening your own bowels. Now for recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. So Father, please help us this evening with the understanding. Lord, I recognize that as we read these verses, the vernacular and the context is something that oftentimes uh, it just escapes us or we don't understand or we just skip over it because of uh, how meaningful the verses on either side of the this scripture is and yet there's a truth here that i i desire for you to teach us and we ask your help with that in jesus name amen well there really is a truth here in this little passage of scripture most of us know second corinthians chapter six at least most of us know the part where the bible talks about separation from the world or separation not just from the world but from being yoked up being partnered up with the world. And so we know uh, wherefore come out from among them, uh, verse 17. You know, we, so we begin in verse 14, being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what part hath, uh, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord or agreement hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Uh, and what agreement hath the temple of God? with idols. And then the evidence, ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, in conclusion, come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And last year, and, and, I, and if, you, if you weren't here for it, I recommend for you to go online and find our separation series. I think it will really help you a lot. But last year we preached a series on biblical separation. And one of the things that we learned was that separation is not a negative word. Separation is a positive word. It has a negative wrap. In other words, we think separation means being against something or opposed to someone, but actually isn't true at all. 
Separation is the natural response to the realization that God is high and lifted up. And that because He is holy, we are to be holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And so separation is a natural reaction or it is a natural consequence of holiness. If an individual is holy, he naturally will be separated from that which is unholy. Just like God cannot be evil and be good, a person who's holy cannot be holy and be yoked up with evil. That's the principle behind it. And you say, well, Pastor, that seems negative because you're separated. No, because when you study Isaiah chapter 6, for instance, one of the things that you see is Isaiah seeing the Lord high and lifted up, seeing himself separated from God. The consequence of his separation is that he says, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And then God had an angel take a coal from the fire of the altar and touch his lips and say, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. And now Isaiah has been, made, has been cleansed. Then comes the part that makes separation a positive, uh, a positive response or a positive thing. Because then the next thing is that they said, Who will go for us? Or whom shall I send? And literally the separated one is sent into the world, not as part of the world, but sent as one who has been cleansed, not better than the people he's sent to but as a cleansed individual to preach the same cleansing. You'll never reach a lost world without separation. You'll never reach the lost until you're separated from them. That's a biblical truth of separation. Separation isn't because you hate the world. Separation is because if you're like the world, then what's the use of them changing mm -hmm. to be like you? You know, the church has really, really missed, and I mean the church at large, they've really missed that truth, haven't they? The church's mantra at large today is we're just like you to the world. Our music's like yours. Our behavior's like yours. Everything, we're just like you. You come to us, we're just like you are. There's no hope in that. There's no help in that. The world's lost. And separated people need to come and say, you can be like Jesus. You can be like God. And the means for that is Jesus Christ. And so there's a sermonette on that. I, I hope you'll go and check out our series on separation. Something that will really settle you and really help you with your mindset and philosophy on how to do ministry. Uh, but that's the conclusion of this text of the Scripture. And I would have to say, let me just pull the audience this evening. How many of you have heard or have even memorized this passage of Scripture in context of being not unequally yoked with unbelievers? Most of us have, right? Like, I don't know how many times as a teenager, uh, individuals came and preached to me, hey, don't marry someone who doesn't love Jesus, whether they're saved or whether they're lost. And that's a fine application for that. And actually, for teenagers, it's a pretty, is a pretty practical one. If you date someone who's lost, you're more likely to marry someone who's lost or enter into uh, being unequally yoked. But actually, it isn't just marriage. It's just everything about life. Everything about like pastor means I can't be friends with a lost person. No, 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 I need to be separate from a lost person. By separate, it does not mean I cannot go to that person with the gospel or I cannot affiliate or associate with that person. It simply means I need to be holy. And I need to come to them as holy, not the same as you are. I, I remember a few years ago uh, being with some guys that really ought to have known better just for the time that they'd been saved. I remember they were talking to me about uh, how that they were going fishing with some people that were lost. They, were they had a boat and they were taking some lost people fishing, which, by the way, I think is a fantastic idea. <clears throat> Every time that I get to go fishing with lost people, it comes up. The gospel comes up. And I don't bring it up. They bring it up. And I mean, it's just the best time uh, to teach and to, to be alone where a play, you know, people are just, it's just a conducive environment for preaching the gospel. I'm all for that. One of the things they told me, they said, uh, yeah, they said, you know, and, and this lost guy we've been taking fishing, he brings his beer along, and we don't say anything about it, you know, we don't want him to feel bad, but he, can, he brings his beer along, you know, and, and uh, when he asks us to, we'll even drink a beer with him, just so that he knows, you know, we don't judge him. Huh. Well, the Bible says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And I know there are a lot of Christians today that are deceived about it, but I'm not, and anyone who reads the Word of God ought not be, and anyone who is deceived is uh, what, they, well, you know, it's the Bible is being polite about calling you a fool when you think that that sort of behavior is okay. 
You know, you're not going to reach that person by convincing him you're the same. You're going to reach him by being holy. Amen. We had several of us, Luke and uh, Anthony and um, uh, Brother Mark and, and myself, and maybe maybe some others, and maybe, maybe Charlie. No, Charlie left us. It was Devin. Um, Charlie went to New York to see a friend halfway through the job. We were working on the fence over here, and the, the guys next door were really happy about it. We were putting the fence in because it, you know, it was an improvement to their property as well. And so they were as cooperative as they could be in helping us with whatever. We were putting the fence up. But to show their gratitude, the guy went over next door to the liquor store, and he got us a cold case of beer, like a nice like a bottle of beer. And it meaning nothing by it, came over and brought us cold beers. And uh, <laughs> it was a little bit of an awkward minute, I suppose, for me, but really it wasn't too awkward. He said, hey, cold beer, you know, and I said, you know, thank you so much, we don't drink. That's all I said, thank you so much, we don't drink. And he said, more for me. And he went and put it in his fridge. And Then he went and got uh, ginger beer, non-alcoholic for us. It was really good. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, offered us that. Do you think that the guy will never speak to me again because I didn't drink beer? No. It didn't even offend him in the least, actually. He just learned something about Christians. And that is that because God is holy, we're supposed to be holy. That's all I learned. It's not, oh, we're better, or we're whatever, different. No, just, just a natural thing. You know, Christians are ashamed of, of holiness sometimes. And that ought to be so. And it, it, it ought to be something you feel badly about. You know, you can be very, very kind to somebody and just tell them, you know, we don't do that. Not because I'm not better than any person that drinks beer. There's nothing, there's nothing about my not drinking beer that makes me better than someone else. It's just I can't because I'm, I'm supposed to be holy. That's all it is. And uh, anyway, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but that's the part of the Scripture that most of us know pretty well. The other part of the Scripture we know well as, as well is just the part about the attitude in difficulty or attitude in hardship. And so uh, if you remember our study in 1 Corinthians, you'll remember that Paul was really, if you want to brand a letter a certain way, Paul was rebuking the church at Corinth for a lot of things that weren't right with them. But I really was refreshed by the way the letter ended, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Last week, remember how he had said, you know, I'm not going to be coming to you. And the implication there was, you don't need me. And actually, that was kind of a compliment to the church at Corinth. In spite of the reality that they were being rebuked about something, what was implied in Paul rebuking them was that they listened. You know, there are people I don't waste my time on when it comes to trying to correct them. I don't mean that in a negative way. Oh, pastor's too good for... No, I mean, there are people that won't listen. And so I don't bother trying to teach or tell them anything because they won't listen anyway. And so what's implied in Paul's letter, which is very negative about the behavior of the church at Corinth, what was implied in that first letter was that they listened. And that they were willing to change. And actually, if you were to read chapter 7, we're not going to this evening, but chapter 7 in um, 2 Corinthians, you'd see Paul's response to the man who was in an adulterous relationship with his father's wife, you'd see he got right. And he was sorrowful over his sin, and he responded in the right way. So this is a group of people that respond in the right way. And so now in chapter 6, the beginning part, we'll just read it. I won't offer a lot of commentary, and I'll get to our one point we're going to make in, in just a minute. I want to make sure it's time for me to done with my sermon before I make my point, though. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here. But uh, I want to read it. I want us to look at the attitude attitudes that a believer is supposed to have. So Paul says in verse 1, We then, as workers together uh, with uh, him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, what does it mean? We, we were in 1 Corinthians when we talked about believing in vain. What does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? Well, to believe in vain means that, and in its context, actually means that... Uh, if Jesus wasn't actually resurrected, then you've believed in something that isn't true. Uh, to receive the grace of God in vain is a similar concept, but it's a different, it's a different topic and it's phrased in a different way. Paul says, we beseech you, I'm begging you, don't receive the grace of God in vain. Well, what is God's grace in the believer's life? What is accomplished? And by the way, you need to study grace in different contexts. There's saving grace, and there's a grace that we live by after we're saved, and they're not exactly the same in context. What does it mean for a believer to live by grace? Do you know? Be thankful. 
Ah, no. <laughs> What's grace? What's grace? Yeah, God's, okay, we can say God's favor, God's enabling. It's God's, God's power in your life. So enabling, God making you able to do something would be a really good way of saying it. So giving thanks, God could make you able to give thanks. It wasn't entirely wrong. I just want to say no to you because you're wearing that hat. So anyway, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, I'm just teasing Tasha. You know, so. um, now to receive God's grace in vain means God's enabled you. God has given you ability that you've received. It's yours. It's not ask God for grace. No, God's given it. It's yours. You have it. And an individual who does not use it has received it in vain. In other words, you're using it to no avail. You have the ability to do something and you don't use it. It's no avail. Okay, you have, for instance, you have a car. All right? And it's got four wheels and it's got a good running engine and you have fuel, plenty of fuel for it, and you push it everywhere you go. Make sense? In other words, a car is good transportation for you. It's really not a good thing for you to push around. Uh, it, it, it's like, do you have gas? Does it run? Well, then get in it and drive it. And that's sort of like God's grace in your life for everything, for victory, for service, for incident after incident. And we see those in the verses to follow on the we're kind of sandwiching our context to get to our point we looked at the separation portion of chapter 6 so look at verse 2 for he saith I've heard thee in time except in the day of salvation have I succored thee that means to nourish you behold now is the day the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation now here's the attitude that we have in not giving or not receiving God's grace in vain giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. You know, it's important not just for spiritual victory, but it's important for the testimony of Jesus Christ that we don't give offense. Uh, I've been wanting to get John 14, 6 in nice letters on the tailgate of my truck. and Or maybe just John 14, 6 in two words, only Jesus. I love John 14, 6. I don't have a life first, but I suppose if you pinned me down and made me pick one, it would be only Jesus. Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, if I have John 14, 6 on my tailgate, and I make it a point to cut every person off in traffic that I possibly can, which sometimes I do, that might do harm to the ministry. You see what I'm saying? So uh, that would be, you know, we have to be careful about what we do not to give offense, not to offend somebody. Now, sometimes people are offended, and they're, they're just offended because... They choose to be offended by that. You ever met that person? And it doesn't. It isn't that you did something to offend them. It's that they wanted to be offended. and They found their. They found uh, whatever they could, you know, twist to make it seem as though they had cause for offense when it actually wasn't so. And you can only do so much about that in life. There are some folks, you know, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt for quite a while, and I'll just apologize for everything that offends them and try not to do it. But at a certain point, I realize with that person. I have uh, that they just want to be offended at me. They want to, they want to be disrespectful, or they want to have a reason not to come under the authority of the word as I preach it. And so their their motivation is I wish to be offended. And you just there's just nothing you can do about folks like that. And that's not what the scripture's talking about. It's saying don't give offense in anything. All right. And then in verse four it says, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities. In distresses. Now we could go through these words and we could uh, we could look at or teach the meaning of them, but I'm not really preaching through the text this evening. I want to give us context for our context for our one point that I'm going to make here sometime. Okay? So we see the things that we do in order to approve or to prove that we're ministers of God. A minister is a servant. So proving that we're servants of God. Verse 5: stripes in imprisonments. Stripes is being whipped. In imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. And then the attitude, or how it's accomplished. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. By love that isn't pretend, not words. You ever met somebody that they'd like to throw the word around? Uh, they say, I love you, brother. Mm -hmm. uh, anything I, there are two, two things people say. 
They say, anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can do for you? Just let me know. And I just think when people tell me that, there are some people that they'll do anything for you, and there are some people that you know the words are empty words. It's almost like they even laugh at you when they tell well, you actually could do, <laughs> I can't do that, brother, sorry. You know, well, they, their words are feigned, they're fake. Uh, I love you, and is there anything I can do for you? Uh, sometimes are feigned, they're, they're sometimes pretend, and I, you, you know folks that are like that, don't you? You know folks that that's the context. And the Bible says our faith is not to be feigned or pretended. Uh, if we're told that we are supposed to exercise charity, which is love for the brethren, do you not think that that requires sacrifice, or does it not require proving our words? Not just saying, but doing. And when a, when a believer and when a church comes to that place, when they really have a faith unfeigned, that is an effective ministry. That's a ministry that not only is uh, the ministry not blamed or you're not provoking people or causing people to blame the ministry, but you are a ministry that is validated. And there are many times in ministry, that I'm sure you've had many times in your life, when you have actually acted out, carried out the scriptural commands, not only with the things you're to do, but with the attitudes you're to have as you do them, and you found that it has created or has made it so that you're effective in reaching people for Jesus Christ. That's what we want to be, isn't it? Ultimately, we want to have rejoicing. And that brings us as well into our context. Uh, here's more attitude, verse 8. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, uh, as deceivers, and yet true. Now the perception here is perceived deceivers, not, you know, you're a deceiver. But you see the, the juxtaposition, or the opposites. The one word seeming to be the opposite. And notice this, as unknown, and yet well known. Study that sometime and ask the question, how can an individual be unknown, and yet well known? Well, the answer is very simple. God knows you. God knows your works. I, you know, I, I uh, look at every of uh, each of the letters to the seven churches in uh, Asia in Revelation when Jesus says, "I know thy works, I know, I know." Jesus knows you. Others may not know you. You may be unknown, unrecognized, uh, unapplauded, and yet you're well known. As unknown and yet uh, well known, and then. Uh, as dying, and behold, we live. Boy, has that ever gotten you the reality of the brevity of this life? Sunday night on our way home from church, we had to go to a detour because of a bad accident near our home. And it ended up being a fatality accident. accident. There was another accident, so I walked out to see if the folks were all right. I ended up talking to some of the workers at the checkers uh, down, down the street from us, and they were really upset. They said, you know, this man is just sitting at a stoplight, and now he's dead. You know, he just minding his own business, sitting at a stoplight, he just got killed for no reason. It was really upsetting to them, and it's an upsetting circumstance, obviously. You know what that brought up? It brought up the reminder that we're all going to have that day, whether it's sitting at a stoplight and sudden, or whether it's living out what we would think would be full years in a life which is just a vapor, and years that just go by like, like, uh, like nothing in a flash. And one of the things that we need to remember is we may be physically dying and yet we live. We have eternal life. And it's an attitude for a believer. And then he goes on to say in uh, verse uh, 9, as dying and behold we live as chastened and not killed. So we survive uh, things that seem to, like they would, we, they would kill us. Verse 10, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Of course that brings us to our theme for this year and really brings us into our context, that part that I wanted to look at, which transitions to the truth that I'm going to get to here sometime tonight. You'll be able to take home with you. Uh, as uh, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. How can an individual go through sorrow and be rejoicing? Well, because of the blessed hope. Because of the blessed hope. You know, believer, we need to we need to see that. It is, it is certain, life being what it is, and the curse of sin being what it is, it's certain that there will be sorrow in 2019. Isn't it? 
There will be sorrow in 2019. There's been sorrow in 2018. There are years of sorrow, aren't there? And yet the Bible says, and yet all we rejoicing. And for a believer, sorrow just isn't what it is for a lost person. The only real sorrow in this life is loss of a person. That, that's what I believe. I mean, the only valid sorrow, I would say, in this life. Now, someone could probably come up and share with me some valid sorrow. But honestly, the only one that really has that sting to it is the loss of someone, isn't it? And that's, that's the way I feel about it. I've, I could just, I'd prefer to go through anything other than before losing a loved one or losing anyone. I just, uh, that's, that's the way I feel about it. And so the Bible says it's sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And for a believer, our sorrow is a reminder of our rejoicing, isn't it? Every time I think of a loved one that I wish were still with us, I think, but they don't wish they're with us, I wish I were with them. And that is the, the hope that I rejoice for. In other words, I've lost individuals, and I miss them. They probably don't miss me so much because of where they are and how things are there. And so I just look forward to getting to that place where they are and being with them. It's sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And uh, that's the truth. That's a key that we need to know. Yeah, it's not to say that in 2019, if something goes wrong, uh-oh, we just missed our theme for the year. No, we rejoice even in sorrow. We rejoice in sorrow and because of the hope that's in Christ Jesus. Pastor, is that our point? No. Verse 11. O ye Corinthians, uh, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Now this is not speaking of you know some kind of uh, medical condition here. These are, of course, representative truths. Our mouth is open unto you. In other words, Paul is saying, I have not been silent towards you. I'm not silenced. Well, what is it when somebody won't speak to you? What? It's mean. Okay, yeah, it, I guess it could be mean or it could be a response to something, right? Uh, when someone won't speak to you, it means that there's no fellowship. It means that you've, you've been cut off. And here Paul is encouraging a church which he has soundly rebuked by saying our mouth is open to you. In other words, what he's saying is I'm still speaking to you. And what does that mean? Well, it means I have hope for you. And it means that you're listening. And it means that I'm not angry with you. You ever had to tell somebody something that you didn't want to, but you had to? That's the way it is when a, when a, a believer instructs or rebukes. There are truths. Uh, I, my favorite Christians are new believers. Aren't that for you? Don't you love the zeal of a new believer? Don't you many times just think, oh, no, I'm going to have to tell them about some things when a believer is a new Christian. Like, you know, the Bible says something and they're uh, just really as innocent as they can be while they're guilty <laughs> for, for things. They just don't know. They just don't know. And you just think, I'm going to have to tell them. Well, you wouldn't love them if you didn't tell them that something didn't please the Lord or something. There's an area of growth or something that needed change in their life, would you? You wouldn't be loving toward them if you just said, well, I'm not going to tell them. No. Paul said our mouth is open unto you. Why, why would his mouth be open? Well, because he loves them. And he wishes to instruct them. And he said our heart is enlarged. And, of course, the, the heart is, you know, that, that center, the center. And what he's talking about here is his heart toward them. He says, you know, I've got a large heart towards you. You know, you're not... I'm not angry with you. I haven't rebuked you because I don't like you anymore. I've rebuked you because I want you to grow. I want you to know truth. And because I love you a lot. And then he goes on to say, you're not straightened in us, uh, but you are straightened in your own bowels. Now, the straightened is the idea is put into a narrow place or you know, go, going through the, if you will, the narrow way and actually, the idea of straighten here carries with it the notion of difficulty. So the idea here is that you know, you're not going through this difficulty because we've put you there. You're going through it because you feel that way. Now, let me help you with something, Christian. Does everyone have feelings? I know sometimes you think if you have too many feelings, you think no one else has any feelings. But the reality of it is, is that we all have 
feelings, and we feel our feelings. They make us feel. And uh, let me just help you with something. The way you feel, the way I feel, is not always in line with what God thinks. It's the way I feel, or the way that I think that people feel toward the way I feel about someone is not always in line with their attitude toward us. And that's what Paul is saying. You think I hate you because I've get written such a scathing letter to you, but I don't hate you at all. I'm trying to correct you. I'm trying to help you to be in fellowship. And my heart is open towards you. I really love you. And if you feel like I don't, it's not because I have put you in that spot. It's because in your feelings. Bowels is the word. The word for bowels is splogs. And it's a good word for guts. So uh, to, to feel something is splognizomai. Splognizomai. I like that word, splogs. Kind of like splat. It's like gut is the word for it. And you ever been just ugh, sick to the stomach? You ever just had a sick to the stomach feel? You ever been wrong about something and really gotten the convincing of the Holy Spirit about it? Where do you feel it at? <clears throat> oh, I'm telling you, I get so sick, I feel like I can't breathe. You know, it's like my chest tightens up, and, and I'm just literally almost like, like I'm going to have to splogs all over everything. You know, it's, it's a bad feeling. And Paul said, if that's the way you feel, it isn't because that's what I want you to feel. You're not straight, and you're not, it's, it's because that's a response to yourself. But then he goes on to say, get over it. And he's not saying get over it in a, in a negative way or like you need to get over it. He's saying this is how you climb past this, how you get to the next place. And so that's verse, uh, in verse 11, I believe it is. He says um, in verse 11, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is... O I'm sorry, I was wrong with that. Well, we'll read up to it though from verse 11. O ye Corinthians, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. You're not straightening us, but you're straightening your own bowels. You don't feel this way because I'm trying to make you feel this way. You feel this way because that's how you feel. And then he goes on to say, Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. For a recompense. Recompense is a repayment. In the same what? Well, he's saying our, our mouth is open, our heart is enlarged, and if you want to be the same, you go right on ahead. He said, why don't you just respond toward us in the same way that we respond towards you? I love you, you love me, and no, it's not the Barney song. It's a, this is the reason I've dealt with you in this way. And now this is how you ought to respond to me. And Christian, let me just, let me just challenge you about something for 2019. You want to rejoice? Want to have great joy? Respond to the Word of God. Oh, you'll get that. Oh. Oh. But it's not because God hates you. It isn't because God is angry with you. It's God wants you to rejoice, to have rejoicing. But I've seen many believers, because of rebuke, not, and I'm not talking about you know, from pastor or from the church. I'm talking about from the Holy Spirit of God. I've seen people respond the wrong way and go the wrong direction. You want to have a year of rejoicing? Get your feelings aligned with God's attitude towards you. Words, when God rebukes you, when His Spirit rebukes you, how do you feel? Now, I, I've learned, thank you, God, for that. Have, that's a, that's a, a mark in maturity when you get to the place where you're like, Wow, you know what? Truth is a really good thing and it sets me on the right road and I love the consequences of it. And I just have to say, let me just tell you this. When I go somewhere to hear preaching other than my own, and by the way, I preach to myself all the time. But when I go somewhere to hear preaching other than my own, one of my prayers before I ever go is, God, nail me. I mean, just hit me right between the eyes. Hit me. Just show me some things. Reveal some things to me. And when he does, I'm like, Ugh, man, I got right there. And then I think, that's a good one. I needed that. And I'm better for it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for it. You know, you want to have a great 2019? 
respond to God's Spirit by not being straightened in your own bounds, but by having your heart enlarged. God, I just love you more because of it. You'd be amazed at what God can do when you have that kind of a response to correction. And so I hope that that'll be an attitude. I hope that'll be a response for us as a church. Man, God help us to be the kind of church that can receive correction instead of the body as a church. You know, some, sometimes we're so prideful, aren't we? We just we can't be told we're wrong. We can't feel like we're wrong. We just can't stand it to be ashamed because of being wrong. And you know something? That's wrong. That's us. That's our attitude, our response. But it isn't what God wants and it isn't the point of His correcting us. It's so that we can know His love and fellowship with Him. Father, thank You for the truths that we've seen again tonight. And I pray that You would help us to remember them all this year. And Lord, we would be able to rejoice with great joy as a result. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Tonight, let's take some prayer requests, shall we?